Good morning, Christian Chapel. I'm so glad you are joining us today. My name is Chris. I'm the pastor here. I can't wait to be back next week and continue our message series. This morning, you're going to hear from Pastor Amy, our children's pastor. Amy's continuing the message series, Inheritance, Stories That Shape Us. This summer, we're exploring many of the stories in the Old Testament, and we're seeing how through Jesus Christ, they're not just stories we read, but they are the inheritance that we have received, that we're living out the same type of faith and righteousness, the same lifestyle of worship and service as those who've gone before us. This morning, Amy is going to share with us from the scriptures. She's going to challenge us to continue to live out the inheritance of helping other people hear God's voice and follow after him. If you don't know Amy, she's been our children's pastor for about nine years. She does an incredible job with our chapel kids, helping them understand the gospel in an age-appropriate way, introducing kids to a relationship with Jesus. If you have kids sixth grade and under, you've got to get them plugged into chapel kids on Sundays and Wednesdays. It's a great disciple-making ministry that helps your child establish a foundation of faith that they'll build on for the rest of their life. It's more important than any other investment you make in your child's life. Honestly, they're probably not going to be a professional athlete. They might not be president, but they will all be followers of Jesus if you'll do everything you can to make it easy for them to make that decision. This morning, you're going to hear from Pastor Amy. You'll see her heart. You'll hear just how God speaks to her and how she translates that into a passion to helping kids hear and understand God's voice. Please help me welcome Pastor Amy Byler. Hi. Well, good morning again. So uh, if I stumble over my words, first service, I could not get out the words specifically. Just blame it on Camp Brain, and we'll just keep going. But I am really excited to get to talk to you this morning. And for those of you who are at camp, sorry you have to hear me again. because You heard me all last week. But at least the kids are getting a little break from hearing my voice. So Steffi Cunha is over there and leading them in a wonderful message this morning. So I'm very thankful um, for her leading the kids. And this morning, I want to talk to us today about the inheritance we have from Samuel about hearing God's voice and obeying it. And I decided before I started preparing my message to do a little reconnaissance to find out how much of Samuel's story do people know. So I asked my two boys, they're, they're away at youth camp right now, so they're not going to hear me throw them under the bus, but unless they watch, the, they probably won't. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, so we'll just keep going with it. So I asked my oldest first, they were, they were in separate rooms, and I said, what do you know about Samuel? He said, he had really long hair. Like, oh, that's Samson. No. And then my, ne my second son came downstairs. I said, what do you know about Samuel? He's like, he was really strong. Also, Samson. <laughs> I don't know if it's a parent fail or a children's pastor fail, because they've been in Chapel Kids ever since I've been there. So, um, but I said, no, Samuel. Luckily, they said, oh, yeah, yeah, the, the guy who heard God speaking to him at night. Okay, good. Yes, that is correct. So hopefully I won't say Samson instead of Samuel this morning. But again, we can just blame it on the camp brain if that happens. But yes, we're talking about Samuel today. And there's actually so much about Samuel's life that we could spend several weeks talking about Samuel. I only have a little bit of time this morning, so we're going to hit some highlights of his life. But basically just um, we're going to hit the point that the inheritance we have from him is that we can hear God's voice and we have a responsibility to obey as well. And so we're going to start off at the beginning of Samuel's life. He was born to a woman named Hannah and her husband. And Hannah could not have children. And for many, many years, she prayed and asked God to grant her a child. And she would go to the temple year after year after year and pour her heart out to the Lord and ask for a child. And she even made a vow to the Lord. She said, if God, if you grant me a child, I will dedicate him to you for the rest of his life. And God heard her request and gave her a son. And she did, like she said she was going to, she gave him in service to the Lord. And this is where we get the scripture that we have our parents pray at child dedications here at Christian Chapel. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition. Now give him to the Lord for his whole life. He will be given to the Lord. And that is the prayer that Hannah prayed for Samuel. And so she sends Samuel to serve under Eli, the priest, and he begins to serve there under Eli and learning more about the Lord. 
And at some point in Samuel's life, he hears God speak to him. And this was an unexpected occurrence for a couple of reasons. The first one we find in 1 Samuel 3.1, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. So people were not hearing from God very much during this period of history, probably because there was a very large amount of moral apostasy. Many people were not doing what God wanted them to do. They weren't following in the ways of God. And so they were not hearing from God. Either God wasn't speaking or they weren't listening. But no one was really hearing much from God. So this was unexpected for Samuel. And the second reason we find in verse 7 Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. God had actually never specifically spoken to Samuel before. And so Samuel did not know it was God speaking to him. So Samuel hears this voice calling him and he assumes it's Eli. So he goes to Eli in the middle of the night, wakes him up and said, You called me. And Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. So Samuel goes back to bed. He hears it again. Samuel. Samuel gets up, goes to Eli. Eli, you called me. Eli, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Samuel goes back to get bed. A third time, God calls to Samuel. Samuel gets up, goes to Eli. You called me. Eli said, I didn't call you. And then he finally realizes that it's God speaking to Samuel. So he says to him in verse 9, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Sure enough, Samuel goes back to bed. Samuel calls, God calls Samuel again. And the Bible actually says this time that God stood there. So I don't know if he actually saw him, but he's definitely hearing him now and maybe seeing him, which could be amazing. And God gives Samuel a prophecy concerning Eli, his mentor. God tells Samuel that he's about to punish Eli and his entire family for the sin in their lives. We're going to get into more detail about that moment later. But from this point on... God began to speak to Samuel in a really special way and on a regular basis. Verses 19 through 21 of 1 Samuel chapter 3 say, The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. So Samuel became a judge for the people. He was also known as a prophet of God to them. We also know that he anointed Saul to be the first king of Israel, and then later anointed David to be the second king of Israel. And so we see through Samuel's story that we have an inheritance to hear God's voice, but we also have a responsibility to obey what God says. Now we have to recognize here that Samuel did not recognize God's voice until Eli told him that God was speaking to him. So even though our main focus is on Samuel this morning, we want to spend some time and look at Eli. So Eli was a priest at the time. And a priest is supposed to be hearing from God on a regular basis. The problem was Eli was not hearing from God on a regular basis. He was having a lot of issues in his own life. He had two sons who were very wicked who also served as priests. And even though he rebuked these sons of his, he didn't do very much about it. He didn't really take action to remove them. And we don't know everything that happened, but we do know that God, who always knows our hearts, was displeased with Eli's response to this and even accused Eli of honoring his sons over God. And so God was not pleased, and this is why he gave this prophecy to Samuel, that Eli's family was going to be removed from their place as priests. So we know that Eli's connection was not what it once had been and what it was not what it should be. And it took Eli three times to even realize that it was God talking to Samuel. Now, I don't want to, I don't want to be too hard on Eli here because it was the middle of the night. And if you have kids and they come in your room in the middle of the night, you don't always know exactly. It's really not the perfect moment for some spiritual instruction. Okay. So there is that. But I don't know if in your, if your family, I know in my family, for some reason, when a kid comes to your room in the middle of the night, they just stand there. And they stare at you until you wake up, and then there they are. And it's, I don't, it's always mom's side of the bed at our house, too. I don't know. I think moms sleep a little lighter than dads, for the most part. I don't want to generalize too much, but for the most part. So I remember when I was eight or nine years old, and I, I don't think I sleepwalked, slept walked. I don't think I did that much. But one time I did, and I sleepwalked into my parents' room, 
And of course, because I was asleep, I kind of I didn't, didn't know to wake my mom up because I was asleep. I just stood on my mom's side of the bed and stared at her. The problem was, it was there was a storm going on. And uh, my, there was a window behind where I was standing. And my mom wakes up just as the lightning flashes. And she just sees this dark figure standing over her bed. So she starts screaming. I wake up, and I don't know why I'm there. And I start screaming. My dad wakes up, and he grabs me. And he's going, ah, ah, ah. I guess he thought I was an intruder. My mom's yelling, wait, it's Amy, wait, it's Amy. And he's screaming, and she's screaming, and I'm starting to cry because I don't know, why, how am I, why am I even here? I don't know what's going on. It was very dramatic. Um, you can tell it didn't affect me at all. But, okay, so, I mean, Eli, it was the middle of the night. So Samuel coming to him, he could have been a little disoriented, so maybe it did take a few times. But... We also know this is not the first time that Eli has missed a spiritual cue in recent, in recent history of him being a priest. Because if we go back to when Hannah was praying for Samuel, she goes to the temple every year. And so she's there one time and she's pouring out her heart. She's weeping. She's praying. She's, she's clearly in distress. And Eli sees her and he naturally, like we all would, assumes she's drunk now, if someone comes to the altar here, and they're praying, I'm not, my first reaction is not going to be, oh, they must be drunk, okay? Eli didn't even clue into the fact that she was praying and that she was asking God for something when they were in the temple. And so he kind of misses this whole thing. So these two instances kind of point to the fact that Eli was really not connected to God like he should have been to pick up on what God was doing in this situation, Okay, but if we still, though, for all of Eli's faults, Samuel still needed Eli. Somehow Eli was able to re recall what it looked like, what it felt like to hear God's voice. And Eli was able to point Samuel in the right direction. And so Eli does play a pivotal role in Samuel's spiritual growth here. So if we're going we're gonna to take that part of Eli, okay, the part of Eli that actually like, was able to help Samuel. We're going to pull that part of Eli out and apply it to our lives today. Because we all need someone to be for us like Eli was for Samuel. We need somebody who comes alongside us and helps us to hear God's voice and to understand when he's speaking. And that happens a lot of times at the beginning of our faith, right? We all need somebody to tell us about Jesus or we're not going to know about him. So that is the first step but then throughout our walk with the Lord, we need people to continue to come alongside and help us when we have hard times in our lives, when we're going through things and we don't know what decision to make, or when we're engaged in things that are not God's plan for us. We need people to come alongside and help us to discern and understand God's voice. Not only do we need it, we need to be that for other people. We need to be an Eli in the life of others so that we can help those people discern and understand God's voice. So we can come alongside and say, hey, that feeling that you're feeling, that urge that you feel that you're supposed to do something or move or take action, that's God speaking to you. And so we, we might be, you might be the first Eli somebody has encountered, the first person to share about Jesus with them. You might be the 10th or 11th or 12th person that just comes alongside and provides confirmation to what God is already speaking in somebody's heart. But it's important that we are always available to help each other hear God's voice. And as you know, I'm the children's pastor here. And one of my biggest goals in children's ministry, one of my passions is to help our kids hear God's voice. To help our kids discern when God is speaking so that they can obey his voice. And every week we have probably over a hundred little Samuels running around this church, sometimes literally running around the church, and they need an Eli to help them to know when God is speaking. They need teachers on Wednesdays. They need teachers on Sundays. They need people to pour into their lives to help them to know how to hear God's voice and recognize his voice when he's speaking to them. And we... I emphasize this a lot all the time, but especially at kids camp. Kids camp is an amazing time because we have a chance to get these kids unplugged from all the voices that bombard them every single day. Just like we have things that are bombarding us, our kids have it maybe even more than we do because they don't always know how to turn it off. And so when we get to kids camp, we can get them kind of unplugged from everything that just hits them in the face 
and they can really stop and hear God speaking. And they discover that he speaks to them through nature. He speaks to them through small group times. He speaks to them through miracles. He speaks to them through sermons. He speaks to them through worship. And all these different kinds of ways that God speaks. And I want to share a couple stories with you um, that we experienced God speaking to us and through the, to the kids at kids camp this past week. So the, a couple of years ago, we decided to split our services by age groups. Just like the kids learn different than you guys, we discovered that the younger kids learn different than the older kids. And so we have a group of like first, second, third grade, basically, and then fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, basically. And we split them into two different services. And for our younger kids' service, they have a little more time to um, just kind of, it's more of an introductory, this is what... This is what it's like to hear God's voice. This is what it's like to listen to God's voice. And it is, we still pray for them. We still tell them the same stories, but it's just more of an introduction. And, and we noticed that a lot of times the younger, youngest kids, they fall asleep during service. Now, that doesn't offend me. It would offend me if one of you all fell asleep in service. Okay. But it doesn't offend me because I tell them, we, we, um, we had a little form that we filled out at camp this year, and I'll get in more into it in a little bit. But one thing I saw across the board in a lot of kids was things that they are, that concern them is, I don't sleep well. Either I don't sleep well at camp, I don't sleep well away from home, I just don't sleep good, I have a hard time falling asleep, I get nervous when I fall asleep, when I'm trying to fall asleep, all these things that they, they struggle with rest. And so I say to them, do you, is, is it easy to sleep when you're scared? No. Is it easy to sleep when you're nervous? No. Is it easy to sleep when you're worried? No. But right now you feel like sleeping. It's because the deep peace of the Holy Spirit is so present right now that everything is put to rest inside your heart. And so helping them understand like that, even the feeling of wanting to fall asleep during service is actually pointing to the fact that God is speaking his peace into their hearts. And so that is something that we're able to tell those little kids about. And I know it sunk in because I had, I had one kiddo tell their counselor the next day, I just, I feel really peaceful. So we know that God is speaking and they're listening and they're able to, to remember, oh yeah, that's what, that peace, that's, that's the Holy Spirit. That's God speaking to my heart. And so that was really, really cool to get to experience that with even the youngest kids. Another thing at camp as you all know, it was very hot. It was going to be very, very hot. In fact, this was going to be the hottest week probably of the year that we had at camp. And so we were concerned about that. We were concerned about the, the heat. Um, we have a lot of, you could see on the video, a lot of water activities planned, a lot of um, there's shade, there's air conditioning in the cabins, which if there wasn't, I probably would never get anyone to volunteer to come to camp. I don't know if I would come to camp without the air conditioning. And so it was, we had a lot of options. You have water bottles all the time. Make sure you're drinking water constantly. We have all kinds of plans, but I was still worried about the heat. And I was praying, and our counselors and staff were praying, and many of you guys were praying for us to have good weather. But the facts in front of us, the forecast was the forecast. And I don't know, the meteorologists, they seem to always get the snow forecast wrong, but they never miss the heat. They're always right. I don't understand. And so there was just that fact right in front of our faces, but we were still, God, you know, we're just going to trust you and can you help us? Can you help us with this? And we, so we got there Tuesday. It was very hot. Tuesday was really hot. And Tuesday night went to bed and got up, woke up early Wednesday morning, and I was staying down in the med station, and um, there's gravel roads all over camp, but about six something, I thought I heard tires over gravel, like that sound of tires over gravel, and when you're staying in the med station and it's 6.15 in the morning and you hear that sound, you think, oh great, somebody's coming to get us, what's going on, somebody needs something, is somebody sick, what's happened, um, but I didn't hear any car doors slamming, so I thought, that's weird. And I heard it again, and I realized, it's thunder, actually. And pretty soon I heard the rain falling. And I jumped out of bed. I thought, I'm not missing this. So I went out on the porch, and it was just pouring down. And the, there was a cool breeze that came through, and it really cooled off camp for the first half of the day. And it was really neat to me because it reminded me the scripture in Acts 3, where Peter tells the crowd he's preaching to, 
um, repent and have your sins washed so that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And I just felt God saying, I'm refreshing you, refreshing you physically with the rain, and, and my spirit's going to refresh you as well. And it was just a really neat moment. We just felt God's favor. We felt his faithfulness. We felt his presence. So I was able to turn around and share this with the kids so that they knew that God was speaking through the rain that we had. He was speaking in a really powerful way to us. And I know it impacted them because many of them on their little sheets that we filled out at the end of the week said, I prayed for rain and it rained. And so just to, to see that moment. And then we had another moment where we had a storm roll through on Thursday night during our service. We were worshiping and it was a moment we all kind of got still and quiet just to listen to God speak. And I heard the rain and I went, checked and ch sure enough, it was raining. And I was able to tell the kids, guess what, you guys, right now it's raining again. And right now is another reminder that God is just sending his refreshing spirit on us. And it really impacted the kids. It impacted me. I was, I think the best way, I was spiritually overwhelmed by the fact that God did what he did. We had like a 20 to 30 degree temperature drop that Thursday night. We had one evening activity that we were concerned about the heat for, and that was the night. And we had blankets. We were watching a movie, and we had blankets out there watching a movie. So it was just really cool just to see God's amazing faithfulness and him speaking to us and saying, hey, I'm here. I hear you. I'm listening, and I'm present, and I'm active. And that was really beneficial and very, very impactful to us and the kids to see God speak in that way. I mentioned the handouts we did. We did a little handout at the beginning of camp and another one at the end for the kids. And the first one was, what are you looking forward to at camp? What do you want to do that you've never done before? What's something you want God to help you with? And at the end of camp, it was, you know, how did God speak to you? And what prayers did he answer? And that was really cool to see them write down things they wanted God to do. And at the end, say, God answered my prayer here. God helped me with this. One kid put down... God told me to tell everybody about him. And I thought, that is so cool. And it's really cool that I can now follow up with him and say, yes, that's in the Bible. That's what we're supposed to do, and you just do it. So I think that was really neat just to, just to see that God was speaking to those kids. And we had one um, boy on Tuesday night just felt like God was speaking to him in a powerful way, and he wanted to get baptized. And we've never done water baptisms since, when I've, since I've been children's pastor at Camp Egan. We've never done that. And we had already planned on doing some with one of the counselors who was coming with her children. And so this boy came up to me Wednesday and he said, I want to get baptized. I said, well, your parents are both here. That works great. So if they're good with it, we'll do that. And it was just a really neat moment to see kids hearing God's voice and immediately responding in obedience to do what God had called them to do. And that baptism you saw in the video was a really powerful moment that we did. We go to the mud pit, which you also saw. It's really fun, believe it or not. It's really enjoyable, the mud pit. I love it. I think it's become a, a camp thing. My son has to tackle me in the mud pit every year, and it always gets caught on camera. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, we get there, we get all muddied up, and then we get in the river, and we rinse off, and then we just, I had just planned to do the baptisms then because we were in the river, we were all together didn't even think about the symbolism of the mud pit and then getting clean. It just went right over my head. And to one of our counselors, who was a first-time counselor there, she said, you ever done that before? No, this is our first time. She goes, I figured you always did it, and you always do it after the mud pit because, you know, the mud symbolizes our sin, and then, then you rinse off the mud, and then you get baptized. And I was like, yep, that's a great idea. I'm so glad. So even in, like the, even in the planning, God was speaking without us even realizing it. And it was just a really cool moment of once again, just God speaking. And I could tell you so many stories about this camp and previous camps and really nine years of stories as a children's pastor of people who have kids who have heard God's voice and times we've been able to point out to them, that is God speaking to you and you need to obey it. Something else I really always try to emphasize with the kids, not only how to hear God's voice, but I want them to know what God's voice will never sound like. And so I really emphasize to them, if somebody comes to you and tells you God said this, or if you feel like God said something, you've got to weigh it with your, in your Bible, because God's never going to speak anything that goes against the word of God. And so we always try to make sure that that is important to know, because we want our kids to be grounded in the truth, and as they hear God's voice, to know that they can check it, and they can know for sure that it's God speaking or not. 
So as we look back at our lives, I've been talking a lot about the kids hearing God's voice. I want to talk about us for a moment. As we walk in this inheritance of hearing God's voice and, and obeying it, uh, we need to look back at Eli. We know Eli didn't get it right most of the time. But we can do better than Eli did. And there's four specific things that we can do when we are working on hearing God's voice and helping others hear God's voice. And the first thing we need to do is we need to have a relationship with God. If we're not close to him, we're not going to hear him talking. If we're not spending time with him, we're not going to hear him speaking to us. I always give the kids this analogy to think of your best friend, and many of you probably your spouse. And if you didn't spend any time with them, you really wouldn't know them. You wouldn't know what they like. You wouldn't know what they don't like. You wouldn't know how they react to different situations. And it's the same thing for, for God. If we don't spend time with him, we don't know anything about him. But the more time we spend with God, the more we begin to know what he likes. We know what displeases him. We know the things that move his heart. And then we can begin to walk along with him in that. And that brings us to the second thing we need to do is we need to be rooted in the Bible. Because if you want to know what God's heart is on something, it's in his word. Okay? He has put it in there for us. And so if you're seeking to hear God's voice on a matter, I would encourage you to, to read your Bible. Because God will help you. And one of the Holy Spirit's job, jobs is to show us what the Bible means. is to help us understand the scriptures. So as we are seeking, we can ask the Holy Spirit and he will open our eyes to the scriptures. And help us to understand and help us to discern what God is saying. And another thing we need to have if we want to help people hear God's voice, is we need to have a relationship with other people. Samuel wasn't just a prophet. He was a judge. And he kept up his relationships with the people. 1 Samuel 7, 15 and 16 say, Samuel continued as Israel's leader all the days of his life. From year to year, he went on a circuit from Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah, judging Israel in all those places. So Samuel continued to be a part of the people's life regularly. He regularly made connection with them, became part of their lives. And even his relationship with Saul wasn't just relegated to him anointing Saul as king. You can see in 1 Samuel that there's a lot of back and forth communication between Saul and Samuel. And so they continued a relationship so much so that Samuel then was able to have a platform to speak into Saul's life when Saul made mistakes. Samuel was able to come in and talk to him about what God wanted him to do. And it's the same thing for us. If we're going to try to go around and tell people what we, what we feel like God is saying to them without any context of a relationship, it's not going to go very well, especially if you feel like God has a corrective word that you want to share with somebody. We need to seek to, to know each other and to be known in a community. And so then if God speaks something, we have a jumping off place, a place where we have a relationship already, and we're able then to share things more freely in that context of a friendship. And the last thing that we need to have when we are working on hearing God's voice and helping others is we need to have courage and we need to have discernment to speak up. Now remember I told you at the beginning when we were talking about Samuel that when God first spoke to him, it was a prophecy actually about Eli and his family and the destruction that was coming. Could you imagine how Samuel felt having to tell Eli, his mentor, that his whole family was about to be destroyed? Okay, that would be difficult. And it took a lot of courage probably for Samuel to actually speak up and tell Eli what God had shared with him. And so sometimes we need to have courage when we are speaking up as well. And later, when Samuel then anointed David as the second king of Israel, Pastor Lauren and Pastor Chris Godfrey mentioned this earlier, but Samuel didn't just go with the natural choice to anoint the oldest son of Jesse. It said he stopped, and he listened to God, and he used discernment to pick not the oldest, not even the second oldest, but the very youngest of the sons, David, to rule as the next king of Israel. That required a lot of discernment. Well, Samuel was faithful to listen to God and to obey what he said. Whether he was acting on words of comfort or words of correction, he was always listening and he was always obeying. Because sometimes we're going to have to tell people that what they're engaged in is not God's plan for them. And those kinds of moments take courage, they take discernment, they also take a lot of love that's needed. And we must be speaking the truth in love. 
See, when God rejected Saul as king because Saul disobeyed God's commands, Samuel had to give him the news that he'd been rejected as God's king. But you can tell that Samuel had a deep love for Saul because in 1 Samuel 15, 35, he said, Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him. He was heartbroken that Saul had chosen to reject God's laws. And when the people would reject God's laws, it broke Samuel's heart. But then when they would beg him to pray for them, he always did. He considered it an act of obedience to God to pray for the people that he was serving because he loved them so much. And when we love the people in our lives, it's easier for us to speak to them in love. And that's why the context of a relationship is so important when we're seeking to help people hear God's voice. Now, in a kids' ministry, I love to finish our kids with a challenge and leave them with something that they can work on or think about. And I usually give them one. I'm going to give you three today. I think you can handle the extra two challenges. So I have three challenges for us today. The first one is, how can you hear God's voice for yourself? Well, my question, my follow-up question is, are you tuned in to God's heart? Are you spending time with him? Are you learning to about the things that move his heart. And the closer we get to God, the more we, our heart beats in time to his heart. And then we can hear his voice more clearly. And the second challenge today is who can you help to hear God's voice? I just spent a week with 30 amazing men, women, and teenagers who are dedicated to helping kids hear God's voice. And I saw them walk alongside these kids and find just even the smallest moments to share that God was speaking to their hearts about everything. And we need people like that. And so who are you investing your time in that you can help hear, that you can help them hear God's voice? It's not always going to be someone younger than you. It could just be someone younger in the faith than you. Or it could be a friend that you do life with. Somebody you hang out with at a home group or on a Wednesday night meal or something like that. But I want to encourage you to put yourself in a position where you are able to help somebody else hear God speaking to them. And my last challenge for you today is what will you do when you hear God's voice? God is always speaking. And there are plenty of people that hear God speak all the time but not as many who stop and listen and obey. There's plenty of people who come to church and and they they listen to a sermon or whatever, but they don't stop and take it to heart. And the Bible is full of many times where we're told not just listen to the word, but do what it says. James says, don't just listen to the word, do what it says. In Hebrew, that we are told, if we hear God's voice, don't harden our hearts. It's really important that we obey what we hear God is speaking. So the big challenge comes in the obedience part. When you hear God's voice, not if you hear God's voice, but when you hear God's voice, what will you do? Now, some of you might, even right now, be feeling God speaking to your heart. And if you look back at Samuel's story, Samuel was spoken to by God for a specific purpose— He had a word that he wanted Eli to hear about, a specific, specific word. But there was also a general invitation in that speaking that God gave to Samuel because he was also calling Samuel into a deeper, more personal, and closer relationship. And this morning, you might be in either one of those positions. You might be where you are specifically hearing something from God, and he is directing you, he's guiding you. Maybe you've been wrestling with it and not sure if what you heard was God. Just, you're just not sure, but, but maybe you're in that position, or maybe, and we all are in this other position, maybe you're just in a position where God is just generally inviting you into a deeper relationship with him. And that is a calling that we all are receiving. Every day, God is calling us into a deeper relationship with him. And maybe you're specifically feeling that extra strong today, okay? Where we're not just coming to church and hearing a sermon, listening to some nice worship music, and then going home. But he's calling you into a deeper relationship with him where you really truly know him and he knows you. Since the beginning of time, since the creation of time, God has been speaking to his people. He desires to speak to you every single day. Just like the people in your life that you love and you want to talk to them every day, 
God wants to talk to you every day. And he is a creative God. He has something new he wants to tell you every day. Sometimes it might be specific. Sometimes it might be general. Sometimes it might just be reminding, reminding you that he's there, reminding you that he loves you and he has a plan. Sometimes he's there to remind us to change our course. But he's always speaking. And our job is to listen and to respond to that voice when he speaks. So I'd like to invite you to stand. We're going to have a chance here to respond to what God is saying to us this morning. And I want to pray for you. I want to pray that you would be hearing God's voice as he speaks and that you would have the courage and the discernment to listen when he calls your name and when he speaks to you. So let's pray. God, we thank you so much that you speak. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you want to say something to us this morning. And God, I pray right now that you would open our ears, you open our hearts to hear what you want to say. I pray that we would be listening and we'd be locked into you this morning. I pray for those in this room that are feeling a specific calling to a deeper relationship or in a certain area of their lives, they really feel like you're calling them somewhere or to do, to do something or to change something. God, I just pray right now that you'd speak loudly, you'd speak clearly to our hearts, and we would listen. God, we thank you so much that you love us enough to speak into our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Christian Chapel family, I hope God is speaking to you through this message series, Inheritance, about who you are, the inheritance you received, and how it changes your life every day. If you'd like to partner with us in ministry, you can join us at christianchapel.com give. If there are any needs in your life that we can pray with you about, please drop those off at christianchapel.com prayer. We're praying you have a great week and that you live out the inheritance God has given to you through Jesus.